So um, I, I've known Al for a very long time, and I'll tell you how Al came to um, know me. He was um, he one of my colleagues who's a volunteer at the museum and does oral histories did his oral history and suggested that the museum meet with him. And when we first met, um, Al was very hesitant to share his material, his photographs, his personal artifacts. These were very personal for him. And over the 18 years, Al has donated almost everything that we looked at initially. And every once in a while, he comes to my office and says, um, I found something else. Here's something else. So Al's relationship is continuous. And he's been an important part of um, the museum volunteership, especially for the survivors. And I am very grateful that I cannot believe it's been 18 years, but I'm very grateful that you have really done so much for the museum. So welcome. Thank you. And great to be here with you. <laughs> Thanks. So your parents, actually, let's talk a little bit about your parents. And you let's just start by saying that you, because you were born in 1941, your memories don't begin with your parents. No. They really begin with the Madness. Right. And so a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today about your parents' lives were shared with you by your mother. Correct. So they were born in Poland, and they emigrated separately to the Netherlands, your mother, by way of Germany, correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, my mother was born in a small town uh, in Eastern Europe called Rimanov, uh, and my father in a neighboring small town called Kantriga. Um, those little towns were part of the big Austro-Hungarian Empire until the First World War, uh, and uh, then they became part of Poland. And because of anti-Semitism, uh, when they became incorporated with Poland, there was a lot of pressure for young people to leave their hometowns. And so my mother joined older siblings uh, in Berlin when she was about 18 years old. And my father instead went directly to the Netherlands, to The Hague, where he started a men's clothing business. And what did your mother do while she was in Berlin? Well, I think she worked also. She had her siblings there, had businesses, and uh, she worked there. Uh, but what she told me is what she really enjoyed was for the first time really being in a big city. Now, ironically, my mother arrived in Berlin just about the same time as Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, was being published. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she was 18 years old and not terribly interested in politics and certainly not in reading Adolf Hitler's book. So she was really totally unawares of the first stages, really, of the development of the Nazi regime. Uh, so she was very content, you know, to be uh, in, in Germany until she finally joined my father at the end of 1932. Mm -hmm. And you said that she joined your father. Did she know your father previously? Yes, they had been uh, childhood friends and sweethearts. Uh, had known each other for many, many years. The two towns where they were born were only about 30, 40 miles apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, they were distantly related because they had the same last name, uh, Munzer. And uh, so, yes, they, they really had been long time, you know, sweethearts. Uh, when my mother, you know, joined my father in Holland, uh, where they were married uh, December 1932. Mm -hmm. And so they were living in... Um the Hague? In The Hague. Which was? Well, The Hague was really, uh, although people think of Amsterdam as the mm -hmm. capital, in actual fact, it's sort of a complex system, but, but uh, The Hague is the seat of the uh, Dutch parliament. Right. And so to the Dutch, that is really the capital. And certainly to people living in The Hague, that's the capital. Right. Also a very a large city. Absolutely, city. yes. So your parents had a business. Correct. And they were assimilated in the Netherlands? Were they religious Jews? Well, they came from very religious backgrounds, very orthodox religious backgrounds. Uh, but like many other young people at the time, they were also rebelling against you know, the, their backgrounds. And so they were very much integrated into the community, made many friends in Holland, uh, most of them not Jewish, actually. Uh, and that's where their closest friends were, although they still continued, you know, with Jewish, traditional Jewish 
observances. Describe the, if you can, if your mother had conveyed this to you, describe the neighborhood in which they were living in, in which they had your sisters, you. What kind of a neighborhood was it? Was it mixed, Jewish? Uh, this was not a typically Jewish neighborhood mm -hmm. in The Hague, uh, actually. Uh, it was on the street. It's about uh, three blocks from uh, the Peace Palace, the headquarters of the, the World Court. Uh, so a really a nice neighborhood. And uh, my father had his business downstairs, uh, his, his tailoring business. Uh, and uh, they lived over on top of an apartment over the store, actually. <coughs> and a uh, very nice apartment. And interestingly enough, the, uh, the sign that was on my father's business is still in the portico of the store, which is really an amazing experience when I went back to Holland a few years ago and I saw that sign, which may well have been designed uh, by, my, by my mother. Mm -hmm. And your parents, so they remained in the Netherlands. They rebuilt their, they built a nice life in in Den Haag, and your sisters were born in, I'm sorry, 33, 34? My, my older sister, uh, Eva, was born in July 1936. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, an irony there. This is when the infamous Berlin Olympics were held, just about the same time, another step in the rise of the Nazis. And, and my parents actually were married just about the same time that Adolf Hitler finally became Chancellor of Germany. So. All of these coincidences, you know, where the history of the family was really interrelated with what was happening uh, in, in Germany. Uh, but my father's business was thriving. Mm -hmm. They had many friends in Holland. Mm -hmm. As I said, mostly Which not Jewish. Was, is, was vital for them. Exactly. And so in July 1936 is when they celebrated the birth of their first child. And that was my sister, Eva. <laughs> Then in uh, 1938, November 1938, uh, is when my second sister, my sister Leah, was born, Liana, was born. Uh, another amazing coincidence because Correct. that is just about three days after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when the full fury of anti-Semitism was unleashed uh, in Germany. Which sort of changed the direction of uh, the Jews, the lives of the Jews, and for sure Absolutely. in Germany and yes. Austria. Yeah. So your parents, they continued to live their lives, business, they had children. <clears throat> then your mother became pregnant in 1941. Well, yes, in 1941. But prior to that, of course, in May 1940, mm -hmm. there was a big major change. Uh, that's when Holland was invaded. Uh, and uh, my parents, uh, on the night of May 10th, 1940, had been asked to host a man who was a member of the Dutch resistance movement. And according to my mother, he had a briefcase with him in which he carried plans for the preemptive destruction of the big railroad center in the city of Utrecht. The idea was that if the resistance could destroy that railroad center, it would slow down any invasion coming from Germany. But in actual fact, <clears throat> that morning, May 11th, 1940, my parents and, and their guests were listening to the radio, and they heard that the port city of Rotterdam had been bombed and had been destroyed. And a few minutes later, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands came on the radio and announced that Holland had surrendered. Mm. And my mother told me that the first person to speak up was their guest, the man from the resistance movement. And he said in Dutch, God dank, het is tonight. Thank God, it's over. You know, as far as he was concerned, uh, he had done what he could to, to thwart any invasion. And now he would have to accommodate to living under an occupation. But, but he, he was, was. didn't feel threatened. Right. Whereas my parents knew they what were had happened in Germany. They knew what was happening in Poland, and so they knew that things were going to get very rough for them. And so how did they plan for this? Could they plan for it? Well, initially, they tried to go on with normal lives as much as possible, even though they had to register as Jews, even though my father had to take a new middle name, uh, Israel, 
uh, to, to ident always identify him as being Jewish. Uh, they had to register all their property. Uh, they were even banned from using public transportation or from going into uh, public parks. Mm -hmm. But in spite of all that, they tried to go on with normal lives. My mother, for example, told me that, you know, in spite of the prohibition of going into a public park, she would take my little sister, Leah, into the park uh, and, you know, just in our neighborhood and just sort of ignore this prohibition. And then one day she told me a German woman approached her and the baby carriage and uh, my mother's heart almost stopped. And then the woman, you know, went to my little sister and she sort of played with my sister's hair. She saw blonde hair, blue eyes, and she turned to my mother and she said, ah, you can tell that this is good German Aryan blood. <laughs> and, of course, my mother never went back into that mm -hmm. park again. But, you know, they had photographs taken of the family. Uh, even one of my father's brothers who managed to get across the border uh, from, from Germany into Holland, and he now became, was a member of the family. Uh, and what, uh, what about their business? Well, How was their business doing? I, I really don't know exactly, but they certainly had to register their business. Uh, and uh, as, as far as I know, it was still continuing. Although, you know, certainly uh, the German occupiers forced them to make, to, to basically register everything they owned so that eventually it could be confiscated. And then early 1941 is when my mother found out that she was pregnant again. And uh, she consulted her obstetrician, and he told her in no uncertain terms to have an abortion. He told her that it would be immoral to bring another Jewish life into the world. And my mother wasn't, as I said, very religious, but at that time she turned to the Bible for advice. And she read the story of a woman called Hannah, a woman who was desperate to have a child and who would go to the temple every year and pray that she might conceive. And it was in reading of Hannah's agonizing desire to have a child that my mother decided she could not possibly have an abortion. Her obstetrician fired her as a patient. And so November 23rd, 1941, is when I was born at home uh, with the help of a nurse. Mm -hmm. And that brought about another dilemma in Jewish life, because traditionally uh, Jewish male children are circumcised when they're eight days old. And my parents' friends said, don't have him circumcised. You know, it will identify him as being Jewish. But this time the answer to my parents' dilemma came in the form of a worried look on the face of the, a pediatrician who had just examined me. And my father asked the pediatrician, is there anything wrong with the baby? And then the pediatrician said, no, smiled and said, no, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong. It's just that your little boy needs a minor operation we call a circumcision. And so at that point, my father told him of our Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, eight days later, uh, the family and friends all gathered in our living room uh, to observe this first milestone uh, in a Jewish life. And there are actually photographs of the milestone, this milestone, this Brit Milah, as it's called in, in Hebrew. And we have them on our website. We did, they were not included in the PowerPoint, but if you just Google Al's name, you will see on our website we have these two photographs. And yep. we'll, we can talk about how the photographs survive later, but so your parents went ahead. They had a Brit Mila for you. Right. And, and then, you know... Uh, Six, about eight months later, mm -hmm. uh, is when Jewish men were beginning to get notices to report for labor duty. And that meant really going to a concentration camp, a concentration camp still in Holland. But they also knew that there was a danger, certainly a high risk, of being sent on uh, further east, as it was called, you know, towards Germany and Poland. And so this was a signal for, to go into hiding which many Jews did at that time, sort of August 1942. And uh, 
my parents made the decision to go into hiding. Now, some families, like the famous family Van Frank, decided to hide as a unit, as one family unit, in the famous attic in Amsterdam. But my parents decided that as a form of insurance, so that if one person was taken, at least the others might survive, uh, the family would break up and we would hide in different places. Uh, the first one to go into hiding uh, was my father. Mm -hmm. uh, he went into a, he pretended to commit an act of suicide and that gained him admission to a psychiatric hospital. And that's where he went into hiding, pretending basically to be a patient. My two sisters were placed next. Um, a woman, very devout Catholic woman, told her priest that she had a dream uh, in which the Virgin told her to take Jewish children uh, into hiding. So she told the priest, told my parents' neighbors, they told my parents, and so my parents entrusted my two little sisters uh, to... Uh, that family. And so I just wanted to um, back up a little and say that your mother didn't really know the people in, with whom she was entrusting her three children. <clears throat> and so it was sort of an act of faith to make a decision not knowing whether or not you were going to see your children again. Absolutely. This was really an incredibly, incredibly difficult decision. And it was really done on the word of or two priests who were involved, who I met subsequently at her. Actually, Father Ludders and Father Schulling, I remember meeting them after the war, um, and they are the ones who really told me much about the story uh, of my sisters. Uh, you know, it was really on their word, and my, my uh, parents' neighbor, uh, a woman I called Tante Jo, Aunt Jo, uh, I got to know very well after the war. It was on their word that my mother trusted this, this woman uh, to take in my two sisters. So tell us about who your who took you in. Well, Jewish male children were more difficult to place, but finally a neighbor of my parents, a woman who lived across the street, uh, agreed to take me in. And uh, her name was Annie Madna. And she had been, you know, friends with our family, close neighbor. Uh, and then Annie Madna, and then after that my, my, my mother joined my father in the same psychiatric right. hospital in hiding, in her case, pretending to be a nurse. Now, Annie Madna had had some bad run-ins with the Nazis, and she got scared, and she was afraid uh, that the Nazis might come after her and me, uh, and so she passed me on to her sister. Uh, and it turned out that her sister had a neighbor who was a member of the Dutch Nazi party, Holland had the second largest Nazi party in Europe. And so she got scared, passed me back on, back uh, to, to Annie. And then finally, Annie decided to pass me on to her ex-husband. Uh, she had been married to a man born in Indonesia. And she was not. She was born in the Netherlands. She was born in the Netherlands. She was Caucasian Dutch. Uh, but she had been married to a man born in Indonesia. Indonesia was a Dutch colony, so many Indonesians had come to Holland in the early 1900s. And so she asked him to take me in. And the plan initially was that I would stay with him just for a short while. Uh, and then, you know, they would try to find a place for me further north in Holland where most Jewish children were placed. Uh, but he had also had, his name was Tole Madna, and uh, he had three children, and uh, he had custody of those three children, or partial custody, and uh, he had a nanny called Mima Saina, a woman born in Indonesia as well, uh, of a very, very poor background. Mm -hmm. uh, she had worked in Papa Mata in the restaurant that he managed, and then he trusted them to become a nanny for his children. Did she speak Dutch? She did not speak any Dutch. She was completely illiterate, could not read or write. But she is the one who now became my mother. And they sort of voted and decided that they did not want to part with me. Mm -hmm. And they decided uh, to keep me a tremendous risk to their lives, really. And so aside, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Let's, let's talk about the emotional part of it. 
the risk is clear, but the emotional part of it, you'd once described to me that Robbie, the youngest Madna child, was 12 years older than you, correct? 10 years older. 10 years older. And his life sort of changed when you came into their yes. lives. Yeah, he was sort of jealous, actually, you know, because he, he was, as I said, he was about um, 10, 11 years old when I came into the household. Uh, he had been very attached to the nanny. You know, he was the youngest kid. And, uh, you know, he, he felt that he's, he sort of felt somewhat threatened, actually, by this new baby coming into the house that was demanding all her attention suddenly. Mm -hmm. uh, How did Tole describe your, your sudden presence in the house? Did they know you were a Jew? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that I was left with them for safekeeping. That's, I think, as much as they were told. The older children were certainly aware of what was happening. Uh, you know, they had many Jewish classmates. Uh, they realized that their Jewish classmates suddenly were not appearing in school. Right, so the, the two older Matna children, Devi and Will, were very much aware of what was happening. Uh, and so they knew what it meant to have a baby uh, suddenly placed in hiding mm -hmm. with them. And I, I think actually, thinking back now, I think Devi told me that they were aware of the fact that I was Jewish because she remembers counting in her head how many different religions there were suddenly in the family, Living in, the house. <laughs> in the household, you know. Uh, uh, Mima Saina was Muslim, was heavy Buddhist influence. Uh, Papa Madna was probably Christian Catholic. Uh, the children were brought up as Protestant. Mm -hmm. And then she said, and they suddenly now had this Jewish baby in the household. So five different religions. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, when you look at the picture, they're not white and you're white. And I know that you were physically in the house, but you also described that you, maybe the, it could be that the neighbors knew what was going on, knew that there was a Jewish child. There were very few neighbors who were allowed to, 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 to who them. knew. There was one family. But you do describe people coming over and visiting. There were two little kids, and I think they were in the photograph you saw earlier, who, uh, who were allowed to come into the house and play with me. I wasn't allowed out of the house. I wasn't even allowed to look out of, of a window because then people might see out on the outside that there was a baby that did not belong there. So the only view that I had of the outside world was what I could see through a mail slot. Uh, but these two little kids were allowed to come in and play with me, and they were neighbors of the Madnas. Uh, and the reason they were trusted is that their parents were German, but they were German communists. Mm -hmm. they were, so they were very staunch anti-Nazis, and so they were trusted to come in and play with me. <laughs> And, and Papa Madna told, it, Madna told me, or I heard from others, you know, the stories that he made up to explain at the times when the house was being searched, uh, to explain the presence of a Caucasian child, uh, a little baby boy in his household. And he, he told the Germans and people that I was the illegitimate child of his ex-wife and that she had a new boyfriend who did not want <laughs> me around. And it's, it's the kind of story, you know, that, that he was able uh, to fashion. He was a man with tremendous sense of humor also. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing that allowed him to do this. Mm -hmm. And describe your everyday life that you remember, anything that you remember. Your uh, earliest memories are really quite late in the war, so. Sure. Well, I do remember, for example, periodically being told to go into a closet <laughs> to go into hiding. And that was when the house was being searched. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was being searched. All I remember is going into a closet and playing with the Christmas decorations that were stored there. That's a very clear memory. I also remember my two foster sisters, Devi and Willie, uh, doing uh, their homework. And I remember taking a pen and sort of imitating them, you know, and making scratches on a piece of paper. And they started to laugh. And what I remember is how angry I got at them, at their laughter. I really felt terrible. I felt humiliated. Mm -hmm. And it's also, again, one of the memories. And then another memory, very clear memory that I have, was late in the war. 
Uh, by that time, there was very, very little food in Holland. Uh, tremendous <clears throat> hunger. The only thing that was left to eat, actually, uh, was tulip bulbs, which Holland has many of. Sure. And so people would grind up the tulip bulbs and sort of turn them into a soup or something, and that's what we would eat. And then I remember one night waking up and uh, seeing the table set and feeling very hungry. And so I sat down at the table and fell asleep at the table. And the following morning, the family found me with my head on a plate. <laughs> and that's how I had fallen asleep. So that's another of some of the memories that I have, you know, being with the family. And they're happy memories also. You know, I remember Papa Banda playing the piano. Uh -huh. And then I also remember some uh, melodies. Uh, and it took me, it wasn't until after the war, really many years later, actually, that I was able to hear that melody again. And it was uh, an Indonesian lullaby. And you realized what it was. And I remember hearing it. Mm -hmm. uh, that Mima Saina used to sing that lullaby to me. So Mima, Sa Mima Saina was really, you were attached to her at the hip. She was really an amazing woman. You know, she would walk miles every day just to get milk for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was in the household uh, illegally, so there were no ration coupons for me. Right. So people had to scrounge around just to get milk for me, which she did. Uh, and I slept in her bed. Uh, and I'm told that she kept a knife under her pillow, vowing to kill any Nazi who might try to come and get me. Uh, and also, you know, a few years ago, I was in Holland, and uh, a woman said, you know, you used to drink my milk. So I asked her, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, all school children in Holland uh, were given a little bottle of milk. And my mother told me to save half that little bottle for the baby next door. And you were the baby next door. So here you have a young girl, eight, <coughs> nine years old, already participating really in saving a human right. life. So I'm still finding out, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So your parents at this point, they um, are in the in psychiatric high. hospital. And then what happens? Well, they were only there for a very short period of time. Uh, they had one more visit, actually, with my two sisters. Uh, that was on Christmas Day, uh, 1942. Then New Year's Day, 1943, all staff and all patients in that psychiatric hospital were sent to concentration camps. The uh, hospital was closed, and that's when my parents were sent to their first concentration camp, which was in Holland a place called Westerbork, which turned out to be a major transit camp. And then from there, uh, they were taken to a place called Fucht, another concentration camp in Holland, located in the southern part of Holland. And that's where uh, they did slave labor for the Philips Electronics factory. And my mother told me that one day while she was in that camp, every morning, Every early, very early in the morning, there would be a lineup of all the prisoners. And one day they were addressed by none other than Hitler's second in command, Heinrich Himmler, she told me. And uh, he told her, he exhorted the prisoners to continue to work for the success of the Reich. He said, as long as you keep working, uh, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Uh, and my mother told me that while he was speaking, she spotted the spire of a small Dutch church, you know, way in the background of Holland, is very flat. And she said it would be so wonderful if at that moment she could run, peace were to break out at that moment, and she could run to that church, fall on her knees, and thank God for having been freed. She didn't care whether it was a church, a mosque, or a synagogue, just a place to, th to thank God for having been freed. And sadly, that, that wasn't to happen. So it's, it's interesting because when I was reading your oral testimony and you talked about Phillips, I was interested in Phillips because they actually did have slave labor, but the goal was to keep Jewish people from being deported on. There were apparently two groups of, of Phillips prisoners, mm -hmm. and uh, 
I don't quite know exactly where my mother fit in. But all I know is that that, that really did not succeed. Right, of course. Because, um, you know, three months after Himmler's famous speech, mm-hmm. uh, that camp was emptied. Okay. And all the prisoners, including my parents, were sent to Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. And that's where my parents were separated. And can you describe what your mother, what your mother's experiences were that she had experienced? she had explained it to you, as she explained it to you? Sure. Well, my, my mother, um, as I said, that's where my, Auschwitz is my, where my parents were separated. And my mother was sent on to another camp called Reichenbach, where she continued to work for an electronics factory. This time it was Telefunken, which is now Siemens. And uh, what she had learned through the grapevine, that one task that was very important to the to the Germans was assembling radio tubes. And so that's what she learned to do and that's what really kept her alive was assembling radio tubes. And she told me that what gave her courage at the time uh, was that she worked alongside German soldiers who had fought on the Eastern Front in Russia and who had lost an arm or a leg and then or otherwise badly injured, were no longer fit to fight. And so they had been sent back to work in this factory as well. And she said they had become so Mm anti-Hitler that they did everything to try to sabotage the workings of the factory. And it encouraged my mother and and others, you know, to start their own little acts of sabotage. So my mother told me that uh, towards the end of her stay there, she would spend a whole day assembling a radio tube And then when the siren was sounded indicating the end of the day, uh, she would disassemble the radio tube, put it back in the drawer, and start the process all over again the following day. And it's the kind of acts of defiance that my mother told me is what kept her alive and kept her going. And your mother actually was in a better situation not being, having been deported, transferred from Auschwitz to slave labor because in Auschwitz they were choosing people all the time for absolutely she was very she was fortunate in that sense not to be right, picked, you know to to be killed the other thing that kept my mother alive was two little photographs that she had with her mm-hmm. uh, these were the photographs we mentioned earlier there are the photographs that were taken at my bris of my circumcision ceremony and my these they're only this big one by one and a half inch in size And my mother had kept those two little photographs uh, hidden on her body. And she told me she had this feeling, this superstition, that if she ever lost those photographs, it would mean uh, that I had been killed. And what would have happened if the photographs had been discovered on her by the Nazis? They probably would have killed her, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, It's really amazing. Fortunately, my mom survived. The photographs survived and I survived. And of course, those photographs were so valuable and so fragile that I did not dare keeping them in the house. And so they are now part of this museum. And how did your mother keep them when she was at Auschwitz? She told me she kept them in her hair. Uh, and I'm not sure about that. Uh, I really don't know because... Somehow she managed to secure them. But she medicine. secured them. You know, there were other women who had other objects... Uh, that they were attached to, that were sort of a link to a normal life. Um, and so she, my mother told me that one of her friends, a woman I met uh, after the war, uh, who uh, had kept her, brought her corset mm-hmm. somehow to the camp. And this corset became a sort of a, a symbol of normal life. And the women would pass this corset around wash it, take care of it, and that's another link to a normal life right. that sort of kept them going. And did your mother talk, I mean, one of the things that I have often heard is that you had to sort of pretend like you were going about your normal day. You got up, you didn't have toothbrushes, you didn't have soap, but you did what you could to prepare for the day, and this sort of kept the victims moving. Absolutely. This is really, you know, really try to keep spirits up. You know, she, she tried to encourage there were some women, she told me, who were totally focused on the lack of food and who would, you know, dream up these elaborate menus for dinners and all that, which just made their hunger worse. And so my mother told them, no, don't think about food. Think about your families instead. And, you know, it's, it's 
Yeah. It's, it's really trying to find that link, you know, the, the one thing that was positive that they could hold on to as a normal, as a memory uh, to keep them alive. Mm -hmm. And where was you, what happened to your mother after she was sent to slave labor? Well, she witnessed actually uh, the bombing of the uh, concentration camp, the Telefunken factory mm -hmm. by the Allies. And she told me when she saw that factory go up in flames, uh, she recited the traditional Hebrew player, prayer of thanks to God for having survived uh, to see uh, that particular day, the Shekha Yanu uh, prayer, uh, because she was grow so grateful to see that going up in flames. Well, also to have survived. And to have survived that, exactly. Years in slave labor. Fortune, but unfortunate, that wasn't the end of her ordeal, because like many, many others, uh, when those camps were discovered or, uh, or, or factories were bombed, they were put on death marches. And so my mother was put on a death march that just took her to one camp after another. All in all, my mother was in 12 different concentration camps. Uh, she developed terrible swelling of her feet, uh, something that, that she, she tried to take care of for the rest of her life. She was very, very self-conscious about that. She wanted you know, to erase all memories of what had happened. And, but that, that was sort of a reminder for the rest of her life, uh, just from those death marches in you know, ice, cold weather, mm -hmm. you know, walking with just newspapers, she said, that were wrapped around her feet until she was finally liberated uh, at the Danish border through the intervention of a man called Folk Bernadotte, the head of the Swedish Red Cross, who had negotiated the freedom of several thousand women, actually. Uh, and my mother told me that all of a sudden, you know, the guards removed their uniforms and everybody was so friendly and nice and polite suddenly. And then there was this, this man, this, this man, member of the, Swedish aristocracy who insisted on embracing all the prisoners. And my mother told me she felt so bad about the way she looked and all of the women did. So they tried to, to create belts for their dresses and make themselves these prison dresses that they were wearing and try to make themselves more acceptable mm -hmm. you know, to, to this man who insisted uh, on personally greeting and embracing every one of the prisoners coming off the train. Uh, and then eventually, of course, I was reunited with my mother. And she, so she, she ended up making her way back to the Netherlands. But I, it wasn't until the late had, summer, correct? Right. She had a chance. She was actually sent to, to Sweden to recuperate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and she remained there until August 1945. And it's at that point that I was reunited with her. And when did she find out? What happened to your father? Well, my, my father remained in, in Auschwitz for about six months. Uh, and in fact, a, a few months ago, I found a little slip of paper through the museum that had his number as a prisoner. And then it, it said premium employee in German. So I asked what this was. And, I, and no name, just, just a number. And the researchers at the museum told me that you know the wages that these slave labor, laborers earned had to be paid to the SS, to the Nazis, and your father warranted a higher salary. Just one of the amazing little things that I'm still finding out. Uh, eventually, he was sent out from Auschwitz to Mauthausen, and then from Mauthausen, Mauthausen in, Austria. in Austria, and then to three more camps in Austria, Steyr, Gösen, one worse than the other, I'm told, and then finally a place called Ebensee, where he worked assembling V2 rockets in abandoned salt mines. Horrible, horrible, heavy work with almost no food. But nonetheless, he, he witnessed liberation by the US Army, the 80th US Army. Um, but he was so weak, so that he, he died two months later. Mm -hmm. And he's actually buried uh, in that concentration camp in the Ebensee concentration camp, which is now just one huge cemetery. And your mother, you reunited with your mother. I wonder if you can, uh, before you talk about that, what did your mother find out about what happened to your sisters? Well, sadly, 
you know, while I was safe and happy with the Magna family, uh, a fight had broken out in the family that was taking care of my sister, and the husband denounced his wife as hiding two Jewish children. And so his wife was put in prison by the Nazis, eventually freed, but my two sisters were immediately taken to Auschwitz, and that's where they were killed. And they were only six and eight years old at the time. So the fate of my sisters, very, very different from mine. And so I never, I never met my sisters. You know, it took me a long time to begin to understand what had happened to them. You know, as, as a child who had survived the Holocaust sure. uh, immediately after the war, I saw these portraits on the wall of my sisters. And uh, my, my mother's friend, the same Aunt Jo, the whom I mentioned earlier, you know, would tell me what a beautiful handwriting my sister Eva had when she was only about six years old, and how sweet a child Leah was. And so I grew up actually feeling somewhat jealous of my two sisters. I thought I could never live up to their reputation. That was one of the things that I wondered is because they were a presence in your life even though they had not survived. That's correct. So it took me a while to begin to understand what had happened to my sisters. And then I began to hear people talk about people who had come back and others who had not come back. I never heard the term survivor, survive. It was coming back. And I began to understand that my sisters had gone to a place and somehow did not come back. And that was my first understanding of did, what had happened to my sisters. Did your mother know this before she was reunited with you? I don't think so. And it's something that I found out very recently, actually, um, because Devi Matnai, she's now 80, eight years old. I got together with her a few years ago and we were going through the whole story. And she told me that uh, my mother had come to the house, to her mother's house, where I had been hidden originally, looking for me and my sisters. And it fell to her, to Devi Matnai, who was then about 15 years old, to tell my mother that my sisters were not around and to tell her where I was hidden. And so I think that that's the first time my mother found out what had happened to my sisters. Uh, not sure, entirely sure of that, but I think that's what seems to be very likely. And then, you know, she told my mother where, where I was hidden, now that I was now with her father <coughs> and with me, Masaina. And so that's when my mother came to the house to get me. And that's the very first clear memory that I have, mm -hmm. a very clear memory. And I remember being asleep in, one, in the back room of the house and Devi Matna coming to get me. And I was cranky, unhappy about being awakened. She carried me into the living room and the whole family was sitting in a circle and what I remember is that she, the family did what you do with a crying child. You pass it from one lap to the next. And I remember that happened, that there was one woman whose lap I wouldn't sit in. One woman I kept pushing away, and that was my own mother, because she was a complete stranger to me. And so my mother knew that it would be very, very difficult to separate me from, from Mima, and so the, the plan was that for Mima to continue to take care of me uh, while my mother went out looking for work. Mm -hmm. And tried to rebuild her life. And tried to rebuild her nothing. life, right, exactly. And that only lasted a few months uh, because about two months later, Mima Saina had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed away. So I have almost no memories of Mima Saina. Uh, just, as I said, some memories of what people told me about her, mm -hmm. visiting her grave, which I did many times, and then this, this lullaby. And that lullaby came back to me many, many years later, a few years ago, actually, when for the very first time I shared my story with a group of Indonesian students here at the museum. And I told them the story just the way I'm telling it right now. 
And at the very end, I said, you know, they, my nanny used to sing, Mima used to sing a lullaby to me. And I found out it was called Nina Bobo. And all these students started singing it in unison. It was an amazing movement moment and it certainly brought back the memory of the melody to me you know and it's 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 that's one of the few memories that i have of this amazing amazing woman so you your mother you and your mother sort of rebuilt your lives in the netherlands can you describe that briefly sure well jewish first of all my mother acquired a uh, cosmetic store uh and uh, which she felt was gave her time, an opportunity to continue to care for me, um, rather than having to travel around uh, on, on business, which is what she was doing mm -hmm. uh, initially, uh, and con trying to continue my father's business, which turned out to be much more complicated. Uh, and, and Jewish life began over again in Holland. And uh, so that first portrait, that first picture that you saw was yeah. taken at the Purim festival. Uh, which is when uh, Jewish children, it's, it celebrates uh, the victory of Queen Esther over the evil Haman. And then it's traditional for Jewish kids to dress up in costumes. And, you know, this was probably, this was still fairly close after the war, and mm -hmm. the wounds were still fairly raw for my mother. And I remember that she really wasn't in any mood to make a costume for me, that I sort of had to pester her and ask her to make one. And that's when she came up with this idea of creating this costume of the uh, collection box for the Jewish National Fund. And I won that first prize with, <laughs> with that costume. Uh, How was your relationship with her? I very quickly certainly got used to being with my mother. You know, mom told me that uh, early on, she moved into the house with, with the Madna family. And she said, just to get me used to being alone with her, she had given Mima some, some tickets mm -hmm. to go, a ticket to go to a movie, which was really a novelty right after the war. And so <clears throat> uh, she said a few minutes later, Mima came back into the house and she turned to my mother and she said, don't hit him. Because that's how protective Mima was of me, that she didn't even trust my own mother to take care of me. Um, you, we, we only have, a, we have about eight minutes left and I wanted to leave some time for um, questions. The two things I wanted to ask you were, um, you ended up going from the Netherlands to Belgium and then from Belgium to the United States. The first question is, how, was your, how did you maintain a relationship with the Madness? And the second question is, can you talk about the last place you really stopped before you left Europe in 1958 to come to the United States? Well, the, um, we came in, as, I, as you said, we, we left Holland in 1958, and the Madna family, they all came. Well, Papa Madna remarried, mm -hmm. and he and his second wife and the three children from their second marriage, from the second marriage, came to see me, or to see us off when we left for the United States. And I've always always remained, remained part of his family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I last uh, saw Papa Madna about two months before he passed away, well into his 90s. And he told people that he wanted to see his son from America one last time. And uh, because that's how he always, but he always considered me. But that's son. how you considered them as well. And I continued to call him Papa for the rest of his life. And... Uh, and then his last words to me said, take care of your mother, because that's the kind of person he was, much more concerned about the other uh, than he was uh, about himself. Uh, you know, people asked him, why did you risk your lives to take in a Jewish baby, the lives of your family? And, and he said, what else was I to do? To him, there really was no option. There and really wasn't a point choice. Out one more time. That it wasn't easy for him. You were a boy. You right. were white. They were not white. And there was no food. There was no food. It was wartime. He's raising his own three children. Right. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but also, and then right. tell me about your, sure. you and your mother finally leaving Europe. Well, my mother 
had visited my father's grave sometime in the 1950s. And then just before we came to the United States, uh, she felt it was important for us to visit his grave again. And this time I accompanied her. And it's the first time that I really felt the loss of my father is when I sta was standing at his grave in his, in his concentration camp. And I burst out in tears. And it's really the only time that I shed tears for my father, the only time that I really felt what I had lost, his companionship. And it's really that, that loss I have hasn't diminished over the years. It has actually grown more so as the years have gone by. And I sort of sometimes mentally, you know, imagine what life would have been liked, like if he had survived and if my sisters somehow were still around. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's... Uh, it, that remains at something. It's a loss that I still consider to think about. So I wanted to just open it up for questions briefly. Um, do we have mics? Thank you. Do you have? Does anyone have questions for Al? Could you uh, wrap up the rest of your life from the time you came to the United States? How old were you? Where did you go to school? What happened? To, what has happened to you the rest sure. of your life? Well, first of all, how long have you been in this country? Well, I came here since 19, 60 years, that's right. Exactly 60 years, July 25th, 1958 is when we arrived in the United States. Uh, I attended high school for one year, uh, Yeshiva University High School in Brooklyn, uh, and then went to Brooklyn College, then started medical school, became a physician, uh, then a lung disease specialist, and eventually president of the American Lung Association. Clearly uh, not a smoker. Uh, clearly not a smoker. <laughs> and I remain very active in anti-smoking activities uh, right now. So uh, long career in medicine, retired about two or three years ago, and uh, now devote myself to speaking to groups like this, sharing my story. I went to, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center. Then went to Johns Hopkins for my training in lung disease and University of Rochester in between. Yes, right here in the front. Let me repeat the question. Sure. What made your mom decide to come to America? Thanks. I think it was really, she really needed to get away from all the memories. Uh, she was tired also, she told me, of being called the widow Munzer. Uh, she you know, and that, that was sort of customary, certainly, in Europe at the time in the 1950s. It was still unusual for women to have a career, to go to work, and which she needed to do. And so, and it was really getting away from all the memories. My mother never went back to Holland. Uh, she um, traveled extensively. Uh, and I think what kept my mother going, really, uh, was, was just simple defiance. My mother's very, very last gesture, just before she passed away, again, in, she was in her 90s, and it was to raise her fist like this, and then to take my arm and try to get me to do the same thing. Uh, defiance, I think she really, you know, people ask me, how did she keep going with after these losses? And I think that was it. She did not want Adolf Hitler to have the last word. All the way in back? Oh, I'm sorry. We'll do this and then all the way in back. <laughs> do you have a children? If so, how do they take your, your story? <laughs> I don't have any children of my own. Uh, I have many adoptive children that I talk to every day. Uh, but I don't have children of my own. And, uh, uh, and it's always a real experience to share my story with young children. Uh, it's one of the museums, one of the things that the museum does extremely well, uh, and it's in, in the hope, you know, that the next generation might learn the lessons of the Holocaust and, and leave the world a little bit better than what I went through. Um, one more question all the way in back in the white shirt. Yes. Nope. You, yes. Did 
Did you? I don't know. I don't. I doubt it. Uh, uh, Communication it, was probably not great. No, I, I think his his health was extremely poor at the time, and I've seen photographs, you know, of the liberation of the Abenzi concentration camp. Whenever I see those photographs, I can't help but try to find my father's face among all those skeletal men, you know, uh, lined up over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really and you know the many uh, so many prisoners actually were were transferred to hospitals to field hospitals. My father was felt to be too sick, uh, and he was actually cared for uh, uh, in a convent where many of the Jewish prisoners uh, ended up, and he died in that convent, which I have since actually visited. Also, again, an amazing experience to talk to the nuns over there who took care of the Jewish prisoners. I have just one last question. I'm sorry to take the last question, but briefly, we talked before this, and I asked you, do you know what happened to the husband and wife who were hiding Liana and Ava? And you told me that your mother saw... Right. My mother, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't even know their name until very recently when Devi Madna told me and told me where the house was, where my sisters had been hidden. But what I do remember is that after the war, my mother insisted that we visit the woman that had, who had hidden my two children, my two sisters. And um, I, I remember going to visit this mother, this woman, because my mother felt very strongly that she wanted to thank this woman for what she had tried to do, and wanted this woman to know that at least one of the three children had survived. And uh, it's something that, you know, again, took tremendous courage on the part of my mother. And to this day, I don't really know what happened to the husband, mm -hmm. that woman's husband, whether he was ever prosecuted or not. I really don't know. Well, it's our tradition to let you have the last mm. word, so I'm going to let you do that. Well, I think, you know, there are, as you go through the exhibition of the museum, you know, you'll, you'll learn how horrible you know, the, the story of the Holocaust was, uh, and the tremendous loss, but, but, but six million people went through, uh, including my own family. If you multiply the story that I, that I just told you a million times over, just to get a feel of what the losses were. But nonetheless, the other amazing thing is that there were people like the Matna family, who even when surrounded by all this evil, were able to do what is right and to listen to their conscience and to save a human life. And that's really the lesson that I, that I want to leave people with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.